so you wrote this article for the Globe and Mail that everyone's been talking about. Have they? Yeah. Well, they said. Good things. Really? What, what was kind of the impetus behind writing it? Well, surprisingly, they just asked uh, a bunch of filmmakers um, to complete the sentence, what the Canadian film industry needs is. And then I just didn't stop. I just kept doing a whole bunch of them, thinking they'd pick one. And then they wrote back and said, oh, no, it's fantastic. Let us send a photographer and we'll, we'll it sounds like a manifesto. We'll, we'll, you know, make it the centerpiece and make it a manifesto. So I was, in fact, um, uh, you know, slightly unnerved, but not unnerved, but uneasy with the word manifesto because I thought that sounds so directive. They're just um, thoughts on what I'd like to see happen. Um, but I suppose, you know, if you get grand, that's what a manifesto <laughs> is. So, um, so no, it wasn't an article I wrote. It was a bunch of points that um, that the they uh, chose to include in their entirety. Um, but yeah, my, my, my goal was just s stay alive. Don't get stuck in the past because, um, you know, the film, film industry uh, is changing constantly. I've been in it long enough to see major shifts and the money goes here and the money goes there and the, you know, the medium. I, I'm old enough to have people go wax enthusiastic about videotape. It's fantastic. It comes in this little box and you can tape over it as many times as you want and there's never any loss of quality when you tape over it. It's like, uh, and it, you know, so there's this enthusiasm for each new technology, which I tend to have. I'm a real technophile, but anyway, I want to keep everyone alive to the new um, reality as far as I understand it, which is there's never been a higher demand for film fiction. There's never been a higher demand, but you have to be prepared to have it on this thing, on this thing, on that thing, on that, you know, on, there's going to be a thousand different um, venues for it on internet only on, so you have to be, I think, I, I try to ignore the fact that of, of where it's going to show because you can, an, can't anticipate that, you know, 10 years ago, no one knew what YouTube was. Now everything, people are watching everything on YouTube. Including um, this. Including this, you know. <laughs> Funding was kind of a prominent point in all of the, the kind of numbered bullets that you, uh, you highlight. Um, I was wondering how funding has shifted in your career with your own experience. Well, my first couple of films I could fund completely out of Canada. And that was grants or government? That was um, Ontario Arts Council, Canada Council, you know, the Ontario Film Development Corporation and Telefilm. I could put a film together in my own country and make the film. Um, the second film, because the first film was fairly successful, the second film I could, I got some money out of England just to mix it up because they wanted to and I thought that'd be nice. Um, and then, you know, by the time the third film came around, it's getting more difficult and now that's really very hard. So, uh, unless you keep the budget really, really small. Um, and I haven't, um, received any public funding, uh, a Canadian funding for like since the, you know, I don't know, for the last 15, 18 years, something like that. So I've been working outside of, the funding has been outside of Canada since, well, long time, since my third feature. And it sounds like the point you make about um, funding within CBC, it, it was kind of like how Germany functioned in the 70s where TV would offer the money so that they could screen it. And then in Canada, that's kind of what Moses Snymer did for a while. But you're kind of suggesting that this would be all public, so that it would be the CBC that was funding, and then it would get its secondary release on the CBC? Um, I would love to see Canada have a, a, a full um, public broadcaster where we're, our work isn't interrupted by commercials, where it is just a service that is provided, you know, um, and it's funded by our tax dollars. I think that. Um, countries should have one place for that. And it seems kind of, the CBC is neither fish nor fowl, yeah. it's kind of partially dependent on, on advertising, but, and then, you know, advertisers have their own demands. They, they expect something for their dollar. So, um, and they won't necessarily put their money into the one kind of show. And so it's uh, industry that is dictating, again, what goes on 
on the CBC. And I think that there should be just one place. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really pro-business. You know, I'm pro um, sell your wares, make something people want and need. But I think there has to be a place where um, those pressures are, are, are not, um, you know, dominant. I think it's really important for our country to have a, a voice for maybe unpopular views, a voice for new, interesting, strange stuff that uh, people in, you know, small towns are going to wince at, but, you know, but we know that it's important it gets out there. I still think there should be a major effort to, to, to engage uh, a large audience. I think we should try to make the CBC, you know, hugely popular at certain times of the day, but I just think there's got to be, it's like, it's like school. Kids aren't required to, schools aren't required to make money. There should be a, a place in our culture where we don't have to make money. Um, it shouldn't all be guide, geared towards that art. There has to be a place where um, something, uh, something other, and that's something that's truly Canadian too. You no, know, I think, um, anyway, so that, that's, that, was my, that was one of my points on the manifesto. Make CBC this huge draw for major talent that goes to the U.S. now because um, there's not enough opportunity sometimes or money here, and make this incredible place for us for 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 people to come back and do their mini series that they can't get off the ground in Hollywood because it's too interesting or too smart. <laughs> well, that also brings up what I kind of see as the the paradox with the CBC is that. To get something interesting like you're describing requires to kind of them to take a risk but because that money is is public money there seems to be this kind of apprehension to do anything that they think is not completely popular something that would appeal to every possible demographic like this white whale that they're chasing I don't know I don't know if that's true I mean I was just involved with Don McKellar and Bob Martin Michael. on this Mike on this television series Michael Tuesdays and Thursdays it got terrible ratings. Almost nobody in the country saw it. Um, I think part of it is it's, um, it's an, a very unusual beast. It's this heavily serialized comedy half hour series, which is a very unusual thing. And it's about kind of um, you know, people with <laughs> problems. Um, but they, and they didn't promote it well enough, I think. But they are, they, they, they support it, and I think, and they're developing it again. They're for, continuing. Well, they, you know, they have to wait until the budget comes down to actually be sure, but they're acting like it's going to go again. So, and they, I think, they are in fact willing to have some shows that aren't, you know, McDonald's hamburgers that aren't crowd pleasers, but that are, you know, a, a really refined uh, piece of nutrition. <laughs> What I find interesting is, do they take into account the online views? Because, I mean, I personally watched Michael Tuesdays and Thursdays through their site. That's the other thing. Is I, I, I don't know if that's part of the counting. Because sort of the younger, interesting audience is often is, it watches things online and not, you know, on TV when it's broadcast. Very few people, I don't even know when Modern Family <laughs> is projected, right? Or, or, I mean, it's broadcast. I don't even know when it is. I only watch it because I PVR it, you know? So... So starting back with Mermaid, like, have you noticed that there's a, a, a secondary market? I'm always interested in that, like on television, for films that have maybe been around longer. Do they continue to, to be shown? I, I get, you know, I get some revenues from different countries, and every once in a while I find out that it's on, you know, IFC or, or, or um, uh, CBC will sometimes run Mansfield Park. Yeah, I mean they're old movies and they're not. Um, but yeah, they they keep going. I'm curious if that has to do with the the distribution I got, especially with Can, like the that kind of um, the Canadian uh, trope of needing to be validated outside of Canada to be then validated within Canada. I'm wondering if that was something you noticed at the start with Mermaid. Well, I, I hadn't made a film before, so I had no point of comparison. But yes, I got validated with that film outside of Canada, and then it, um, you know, it, 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 people came here. Um, but it, but people really came and saw it a lot. And there are films that get 
awards outside of Canada and still Canadians don't come, right? It was a it was sort of a popular film. It was a populist film. It actually um, respected, ennobled the uh, the artists and everyone. And I think that's actually was its big appeal. I think that um, people really felt like the film acknowledged that even those of us who have to go into insurance sales um, at some point probably thought we could be a dancer <laughs> or, a, or a you know or, or or a painter or a singer you know that there's some artistic element to us all but so yeah so people went in Canada I'm not so um, critical of the fact that you need a validation outside of the home um, because that's how every country works you know, I don't, you've got brothers or sisters and, you know, they're just your brother and sister and then you see them on getting an Academy Award and you go, know, holy shit, that's my brother and sister. You know, you, but you, you wouldn't have um, revered them in the same way inside your home. It's just not the nature of close-knit, you know, communities. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a really natural process that if people outside acknowledge you, then... Um, you, 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 the insiders start to take notice. Was that film developed in a way that would, did you anticipate it having such a broad appeal? Because I, I found an interesting quote about it that said that it's the stroke of genius in the film that it's, um, it's kind of measured and does not go too extreme on certain topics to alienate its crowd. And I found that very odd because it didn't ever strike me like the film was deliberately like holding back at any point. I didn't I didn't expect to have any audience at all. I really didn't. I and I I am from a very very um Calvinist, mm -hmm. you know, uh, background that's very stern and not a lot of praise and not a lot of enthusiasm or, you know, and and you do things for the right reason and you don't do it for money or for reward. You know, it's it's it's, it's a I'm not religious anymore, but I still, you know, bear the <laughs> marks of it. So I made that film um, thinking maybe 10 people will see it. Don't start thinking about fame and fortune. Do, like, if those ideas crept into my head, I'd like slap myself down. I really did. I remember having, I was, I was pacing once and I was thinking, wow, what if it actually really took off? Because I think I had a little screening and people were really laughing and I thought, what if it really took Don't think that way. <laughs> don't think that. I wasn't finished it yet. And I said, don't, because that's going to pervert the process, which I'm not so uh, austere with myself in, anymore. I think there's nothing, nothing wrong with kind of, you know, looking into the eyes of your audience and seeing if they're confused or irritated or bored or, you know, it's, it's important to pay attention to. So the answer is, absolutely no concessions were made to the audience. Yeah. There was absolutely no um, anticipation of their uh, their reaction. Mm -hmm. I think my metaphor at the time, people were saying, what's it feel like, what's it feel like? And my was that it's you're kind of humming a tune to yourself and then you suddenly realize that you've been on a microphone and the world is hearing it and they're singing along and they like it. It was a complete surprise. The response was a complete like, well, how lucky am I? How lucky, because I wasn't hoping for it. It just came, it was just, I was stunned. It just, I had no anticipation whatsoever. It's perfect. It's like Christmas, when without even knowing Christmas is coming. <laughs> you just wake up one day and it's this thing called Christmas. <laughs> it, it's an idio, idios, idiosyncratic film, both in its kind of story and style. And, and it reminded me that was of, deliberate. Yeah, yeah. Because that, that I really remember thinking, oh, I don't want it to have the tone like every other movie. I don't want it to feel like other movies. And I, some people would say, it, you got to work on the tone. It's so odd. I said, yes, it's <laughs> odd. It's like I really, really wanted to hang on to my own weird voice. It seems like it, it's unique in that way, but it's also of a piece of Canadian cinema. I found a lot of films from that period to be different but all have all share a kind of self-confidence and, and idiosyncrasy and I'm wondering if that was kind of a climate because it doesn't seem as strong anymore it doesn't it seems like that's a quality in Canadian cinema that's that kind of brazen confidence in in the style and the, the story and it being unique really yeah I wonder why 
I'm thinking of like maybe Peter Mettler especially. Well, yeah, Peter was a real, and he had a big influence on a lot of people, right? People don't necessarily know, you know, who he is in a broader context because his films are really so um, quite, you know, abstract and philosophical and contemplative. But um, he had a big impact on people. Uh, Bruce and Adam and myself and Jeremy Podesta and um, all kinds of people. Um, confidence. Well, there was new money. Yeah, you know? that's what I was thinking. There was suddenly this new, Canada had been the land of documentary and there was this decision, let's do some, fi do some fiction. And a couple of the people who got to pick who gets to make what had some good taste, I think. I think, you know, Wayne Clarkson and, you know, Bill House and uh, there were several people. There was, you know, um, uh, Tekka Crosby and uh, oh, yeah, there was a bunch of people, but they were, they, they picked films that I, I like, you know. Um, so they're, I'm not... You know, I think if I had been born at a different time, I might not have succeeded. Yeah. You know, um, it was there was a flood of money, and there wasn't this whole cultural filmmakers yet, um, and there wasn't we didn't have a whole developed you know writers and versus uh, directors. We if someone came in with a script that kind of held together, they funded it at that time because there's this this wave of cash. So. You know, I was one of the lucky ones who was standing, and I was one of the first in line at you know, at Telefilm. So for their for their fiction money. Um, so maybe that's what gave us confidence. And nobody said anything. You just made the movie. Nobody had these rules about how movies were made. And I think we're close enough to, you know, it was so long ago, and we were close enough to a kind of auteur mentality. And, the, you know, I think all of those filmmakers were novel vague influenced people. Um, and I think there was a concept of film as art very much then. So a single voice was allowed to be, be heard. You know, I think now there's a bit less patience for an auteur work. It's interesting you mention that because I, I really love White Room and I'm I find it very similar in many ways. I have it in my car. Sorry, I was bringing it for you. I, I forgot. I left it in my car, but we can go in after. Okay. <laughs> I find it, for in many ways, like a continuation of, of Mermaid, but it it had a different response, and I never. I'm gonna kiss you for that because no one likes it. <laughs> Not no one. There's a few. There's a handful of people who really get it, and I really feel affirmed because it's something strong in it, you know. And I and I. And I was so derided at the time. It was just dismissed as a joke, and I'd lost it. And it was like, so for people to sort of find something in it, it makes me really happy. <laughs> it's like having a child that everyone else pays and doesn't pay any attention to and considers ugly, and someone says, oh my goodness, that's a beautiful child. And I'm so confused because, like, seeing it, I don't, I don't see anything that would be ugly about it, especially if for the same reasons that Mermaid was so accepted. Think so. of the context, though, because I make this film that's warm and it's got a really sweet central character and it's funny and it's, you know, and it's kind of magical and it's and it's um, and it has, um, you know, a lot of love in it, really, and it and it has a lot of. Um, it's it, the colors are even warm, and then I do a cool, you know, tough, uh, critical. Um, the people you tend to invest in suddenly they turn, and then you don't like them anymore. And um, it's prickly. It's a it's a it's a it's a tougher work, you know. And people felt those that had the critical community that had embraced me and mermaids felt like I'd turned on them. Yeah. Um, and that's a danger when you're a creator that that people um, feel like ah here's one I like that oh you can't do that you uh, you I'm embarrassed to have liked you. And then they really turn on you. There's a special venom saved for people, you know, who make something that's really different from their earlier work. So and uh, so yeah, the, I I suffered from the response of that.